Okay. Um, questions? No questions? Problems? Antiderivatives? Um, we will we'll get through more experience with antiderivatives near the end of Chapter 5, but as I mentioned on Friday, um, it's not an exact science. It's a little more of an art form, figuring out what the antiderivatives are. There are not these hard and fast rules like there are for derivatives, right? Some combinations of functions just don't unravel, right? You can't find what they came from sometimes. So you have to be a little more um, kind of creative and flexible when you're dealing with antiderivatives than you do with derivatives. Derivatives are very mechanical, right? You see a product, you use the product rule. That's it, right? But antiderivatives, things can look very similar and be very different kinds of antiderivatives. Um, my sort of favorite example is um, They look, on the surface, very similar. What's the antiderivative of this one? Yeah, the 2 is just a constant there, so we saw that one on... Um, what about the second one? Yeah, that one is going to be a natural log. The 1 plus the x squared, right, d over u. So while the functions sort of look similar on the surface, their structure would be very similar in terms of if we were taking derivatives of them, but when we're doing antiderivatives, they come from, from very different functions, really radically different functions leading to each. Well, in this case, remember, so we can always check it, right? So if you get an answer that you're not sure about, you can always check it. So the derivative here gives us the 2. So the du gives us the 2 in that case. So adding, adding an x, a variable, somewhere in the problem can change the structure of an antiderivative a lot, right? We have to be careful of that. A constant it's not a big deal. We can fix constants. Um, constants don't really change the structure of the problem. Um, but you've got to pay attention to the x's. So again, we won't. We we haven't really seen this type yet. Um, but of course, once you see the answer, it's it's very believable, right? If someone tells you what the antiderivative is, then you can say, oh, of course, right? But it can be hard to find that sometimes. So. Today we are moving into chapter 5. We have two chapters left, 5 and 6. 5 is, is the more substantial chapter. 6 is just, just kind of a couple sections, kind of a couple little problems, sort of application of what we will learn in chapter 5. Um, in chapter 5, we are finally getting to the second problem that we talked about way back in the beginning of class, right? If you remember, in the beginning of class, we said calculus is about the limit, and the limit is how we solve these two problems, right? And the first problem, um, yeah, the problem number one, which we now know really well, right, is this tangent line problem, right? How do you find the slope of that tangent line? And we figured out it was this limit of the slopes. Right, which we call the derivative. And then we learned some shortcuts for finding the derivative. And then we learned what the derivative actually tells us, which is a lot more than just the slope of the tangent line. Right? It tells us increasing and decreasing and maximums and concavity. And it allows us to solve these problems, um, related rates and optimization and all kinds of other things. Right? So 
while it starts off as sort of a simple concept, it applies to a lot of different situations. And so that was sort of our first three quarters of the course. And now we are ready for problem number two, which you may or may not remember, but is the area problem. We want to find the area of this region. We don't have any geometric formulas that tell us this curved sort of region. They were very limited with geometric formulas. What we talked about several months ago was that we could approximate this area. Remember how? Yeah, we looked at little rectangles. Um, and there are different ways of sort of arranging the rectangle, but this is one option. Kind of finding the heights from the function, cutting up into roughly even pieces, and adding those rectangles together. Um, this we would say is an estimate of the area. Just like the secant line, the slope of the secant line was an estimate of the tangent line. Well, we want to get a better estimate we let there be more rectangles. And in some sense, we feel like the area of these rectangles should be getting closer and closer and closer to the true area. It doesn't actually get there, but because we can make it as close as we want, there's no space between the true area and the area of these rectangles we can say that the, the true area is the limit of those rectangles. It's the same concept we used here. When you look at two points, you never exactly get the slope of the tangent line, but there's no space between the, the slope of the tangent line and the slope of those secant lines. If you let those secant lines, you can get as close as you want. And that's really our definition of the limit, right? We can make the values as close as we want by picking things sufficiently close together. Here we can get as close to the area as we want by picking more and more and more rectangles. So that's the idea. Now we just have to, to do it, right? We've got to fill in the details to make this work. So we're going to start with a sort of simple example. Let's look at f of x equals x squared on the interval 0 to 2. It's just area. So we're just looking at area right now. And I will warn you that I, I kind of blend together 5.1 and 5.2. So in the book, it's area and definite intervals. And we kind of blend that together. Related. So, so we're in 5.1. This is really 5.1. So let's start by just figuring out how to approximate with four rectangles. It is easiest for us to use evenly spaced rectangles, although it's not mandatory. There are other ways of doing that. Um, and so since our whole interval here is 2, and I'm cutting it into 4 rectangles, right? we divide 2 by 4, and that gives me the width of each rectangle, which is a half. So we're going to take the length of the interval. minus 0 and divide it by 4. So that gives me 1 half, which is the width of each interval. And let's call that delta x. And I think that should seem like a reasonable name for a small piece of x. We're imagining that 
eventually we're going to get more and more and more rectangles, so the width, the delta x, is going to be getting closer and closer and closer to zero, right? And that's sort of how delta x is function with derivatives as well, right? It's the distance here. As that distance gets smaller, right, we're thinking about the values getting closer. Same idea here, right? As we have more rectangles, that will shrink. Now, the, the question a little bit is, how do we find the height of the, the rectangle that we're going to use to approximate? And if you look here with these four intervals, we have a couple choices. And we got a lot of choices, actually. But one option would be I could choose for this first interval, I could choose the right endpoint of the interval. The right endpoint of the interval, when I put it into my function, whatever it is, is going to generate a y value, a height. And that height, I can use for the height of my rectangle. Again, right interval, right, oops, that's not a very good rectangle. Right endpoint and right endpoint. Now in this case, this generates what kind of estimate? Yeah, it's a little bit too big, right? Potentially a lot too big, right? But um, it, it certainly is an estimate. Um, we would call this the upper sum. And we're going to calculate that upper sum, this upper estimate. In the book, they will call this um, capital S sub 4. We won't use this a lot, so it's OK to not worry about that. But that's the upper sum, capital S, and it's four intervals. So capital S sub 8 right, would be the upper sum with eight rectangles. And if we want to calculate this, we just find the area of the rectangles and add them up. There's no magic here. right? The area of the first rectangle is going to be the width times the height. And notice the height is just the function value at the right end point, which in this first interval is 1 half, right, or 0.5. So 1 half times half of 1 half plus same width, but my right end point changes. What's my next end point? F of 1, right? It's 1 half plus 1 half. My second interval, f of 3 halves and f of 2, 4 halves. Okay. Every time I step one width of the interval. So now, because of my function is x squared, I'm going to square each of those values. But if I had a different function, right, I'd just do whatever the function told me to do, and that would give me a value here probably easiest to factor out the one half first, I'd say, since it's constant to all of those. Half of one half is one fourth plus one squared plus nine fourths plus four. Right? I'm just squaring all the x values. What is that? Sixteen, twenty-five, twenty-six, thirty fourths. Also look at the lower sum, which is times the little case, a lower case, 
both lower sum, right? It's the same process. It's just in this case to get the lower estimate. For this function, I'm going to use the left interval, right? The left hand most valued interval. And that's because it's an increasing function. It's certainly if I had a decreasing function, it would be a different point that would generate the upper or the lower sum, right? But um, this is a, a lower sum. Same width. But now I'm going to start at zero, and then one half, and then one, and then three halves. So f of three halves is that height, right? And that's what I'm using for that last rectangle. Now, are either of these particularly good estimates? Meh. Yeah, it's okay, right? They're okay. Um, we do at least have some bounding on the true area, right? The lower sum is certainly less than the area, and the upper sum is larger than the area. Could you do these for eight rectangles? Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to? Right? It's not terrible, but it's messy. Could you do it for 20? Sure, right? Could you do it for 100? I mean, yeah, you could really do it for as many as you wanted to, right? It is not a hard process to do, <coughs> but it certainly would be time consuming, right? The more rectangles we have. Um, a computer is quite good at this, right? This is a perfect kind of operation for a computer to just do a, a simple operation over and over and over again. Um, the theory for us, and I think it, it should seem reasonable, is that um, the limit as n goes to infinity of capital S sub n turns out to equal the limit as n goes to infinity of lowercase s sub n, which we are going to call um, the area. And this is really our, our definition. Um, and and it, well, I don't know if that feels believable or not. The idea is that there's no space between the true area and either the upper sum or the lower sum. So these sums are going to approach the true area from above, closer and closer and closer, but always just a little bit bigger. And these are going to approach the true area from below closer and closer and closer, they're going to go to the same value, and we're going to define that value to be the area, the area under the curve. You know, it's dealing with infinite things, so it's not entirely obvious, but I think with our understanding of limits, that should should feel okay, right? As I get closer and closer, there's just there's no space. I can make it as close as I want by picking enough rectangles. Now, what this also tells us, this implies it does not matter um, which x value in the interval we choose. What I mean by that is that if I look at these lower sums and they're going to the true area, and I look at the upper sums and they're going to the true area, if I'm trying to approximate the area of this interval, it turns out it doesn't actually matter if I use the smallest value or the largest value. So it also doesn't matter if I pick anything else in between. And in fact, you certainly might argue that if I'm approximating this true area, 
What might be a better approximation than these upper or lower sums? Using the mid? Yeah, I mean, what if I use the middle instead of using the left, which is obviously too small, or the right, which is obviously too big? What if I chose the middle for each of these estimates? Can you visualize that that would give us a much more accurate estimate? Right, because it's a little over but a little under for each rectangle. This would certainly be closer to the true area. This is called the, the midpoint. And um, this sum would be capital M sub 4. But what's going to happen as n goes to infinity of the midpoints, if I add them all up, the, mid, the sum of the midpoint estimates, I mean, do you see it's going to be the same thing, right? These are all going to the same place because they're all, um, they're sucking all the error out of these estimates because I get more and more of them. This is also equal to the area. So let's just make a, a little bit of a more formal definition. If f of x is greater than or equal to 0 on the interval a to b, then the area under f of x is going to be one of these limits. Area is a limit, just like the slope of the tangent line is a limit, right? And so the area under the curve is going to be the limit as n goes to infinity I'm going to make a couple little definitions here. So I'm going to let delta x equal you guys remember how did we find this, this in this case delta x was a half how did I find that delta x was a half? B minus the a. Interval I took the length of the interval, which was b minus a, and I cut it into n pieces, 4 pieces, 10 pieces, 100 pieces. So that's what I'm going to define delta x as. It's these widths of the little rectangles I'm formulating. And then I'm going to let x sub i star equal any sample point in the ith interval. So what I mean by that is in the first interval here, x sub 1 star can be any point I want in this interval. It could be the left end point, it could be the right end point, it could be the midpoint x sub 2 star is going to be any point I want in the second interval. So the way we find the area is I'm going to take the limit as n goes to infinity. I'm going to take the width of the first rectangle times the height of the first rectangle. And how do I find the height of the first rectangle? It's the f of x at that point. Exactly. I take the function and I evaluate it at some point in that interval. So I'm calling that x sub 1 star. And then I add to that the width times the second point, x sub 2 star, all the way up, sorry, delta x, times the width f of x sub n star. It's like just summation. Yes, it is. We can write that more compactly with the summation. Because I'm just adding up a bunch of things. Um, and so that is our definition. But it is nicer to write it as the limit 
n goes to infinity of the sum. So this is um, what my capital capital sigma looks like. So Greek letter sigma stands for sum. And I'm going to tell it what to add up. I'm going to add up the values from 1 to n. And for each of those values, I'm going to take f of x of i star. And I'm going to multiply that by delta x. So if you haven't seen this sigma or summation notation before, all this is doing is it's a way of representing what's happening here more compactly. So it starts when i equals 1. I put in 1, and I get this. And then it's going to add to that when i equals 2. I put in 2 there. That's my next term in that summation. It's going to go all the way up to n, which is where it stops. That's the last term in my summation. So that is exactly what this expression is. This expression is a little messy because I have to kind of put this dot, dot, dot in here and kind of hope you know what I mean by that. This is telling me exactly what that is, defining it. And we will do some work with sigma notation as we move into 5.2. So we'll want to be able to do some things with that. But this is a definition now for area. Now the, the question, sort of open question, is can I actually evaluate that limit? Right? I mean, limits sometimes exist and sometimes they don't exist. And sometimes they're hard to find. So we need to actually see, is this something that I can actually find? But I think the first step is understanding what it's saying. And all it's saying is I'm just going to add up the rectangles. And then I'm going to let the number of those rectangles get larger and larger and larger. And if those are sums are approaching some value, then the limit exists. And we're defining that limit as the area under the curve. do this. We, we did, um, we got kind of a rough overestimate and a rough underestimate of our function f of x equals x squared on the interval of 0 to 2. Let's see if we can set up this limit and actually calculate exactly what the value is, like what the limit really is going towards. So in order to do that, I need to figure out what delta x is. And I also need to figure out, like, what are the numbers that I'm going to be putting into this function. So the delta x part is, is easy. We've already done that. You guys already told me what it is. I take b minus a, so 2 minus 0, and I divide it by what? How many times? I want it to be how many intervals I'm setting up, but then I want to be able to take the limit as those intervals go to infinity. So I don't want to divide it by 10 or 100 or 1,000, right, because those are fixed. I want to divide it by n, and then I'm going to see what happens as n gets larger and larger. n is the number of rectangles. Now, x sub i star can be any point I want in the ith interval, meaning starting with the first interval and then going up to the second, all the way up to the end. So these are sort of counting the number of intervals that I have. Um, you can pick any point you want. And the limit is still going to be the same. It turns out, for our purposes, it is almost always easiest to choose the right endpoint 
because we want to define these points in terms of n, and n is something that's changing, and so we have to be a little careful how we formulate this. But if you start at this point, and this is um, this is your a value here, the a from that interval, and this is your b value there at the end. The right end point of this first interval is what? How can I define that right end point in terms of stuff I have? How wide is this interval? It's delta x wide, right? And we know in our case delta x is 2 over n, but in other situations it will be different, right? But whatever it is, it's delta x. So this value, this right end point here is A plus delta X. So this is the first end point. What's my second end point? A plus 2 delta X. Yeah, A plus 2 delta X, because I moved over and then I have to move over again, right? So my third end point, A plus 3 delta X, all the way down to the nth value, which is going to be A plus n delta x. So the right end point of the ith interval, meaning like if it was the tenth interval, what's the right end point of the tenth interval? A plus 10 delta x. So the right end point here is always going to be a plus i times delta x. And I guess I should write this in as just b minus a over a. So these are going to be important formulas for us. Those are general rules that are going to help us set up this area limit right, in, in a way that we can evaluate it. These are not mandatory, but for you guys, they basically will be. I mean, there, there's no reason for us to do different points within my interval. Midpoints are, end up being much more complicated to set up, and it doesn't matter what we set up. So we're going to choose the easiest ones for us to set up, which is this. So for our specific case here, this is um, 2 minus 0 over n, which is 2 over n. For our specific case here, a is 0, 0 plus i times delta x, which is 2 over n, which ends up being 2i over n. Do you see those? Imagine doing those for some different interval. It doesn't really matter what the interval is. You can always come up with these values, right? This is your a, this is your b. You just plugging those into this, these formulas. What this is doing is counting my way over, so it's changing the x values. This one is fixed, right? It's always the same width for each given value of n. So the area is going to be the limit, as n goes to infinity, of the sum from i equals 1 to n my function evaluated at what points? 0 to 2. What, two should, I over. what should go in there? 2i over. Yeah, the x of i star, or the x of i in this case, the right endpoints. As this sum moves along, I'm going to start by evaluating my function at 2 over n, which is right here. When i is 2, I'm going to evaluate my, my function at 4i over, 4 over n, 6 over n, all the way up. The very last time I evaluate this function, when i is equal to n, this gives me f of 2, which is just what I want. That's the right end point of that last interval is 2. My interval was from 0 to 2. So this is doing exactly what I want. 
and then I have to multiply it by delta x, the width. So this, all this is doing, I mean, if you, if you show this to someone who's not in calculus, they'll be impressed at you, but you know it's, it's not really that much. It's just saying I'm going to add up a bunch of rectangles, right? Height times width. And then I'm going to let the number of those rectangles get larger and larger and larger and see what that goes to. So on one hand, it's, it's very sophisticated and sort of powerful. On the other hand, you know, you could describe this to anybody. That's, that's all that that is saying. The notation is effective, but it makes it look more complicated than it is. So, f of 2i over n, that's my function. It's just a squaring function. So that's 4i squared over n squared. Which is the limit as n goes to infinity of the sum from i equals 1 to n of 8i squared over n cubed. We're just plugging the values into the function. We're not doing anything special at this point. But now we need to take a brief little um, pause to take a look at our summation notation. Yeah. We don't know how to evaluate this, this summation. We haven't really seen that or worked with that before. So I need to figure out what this is before I can try and take the limit of it, right? It's a, it's a new thing right now. We don't know what that, what that might be. So we're going to do a little work with summation notation. If you move into Calc 2, You'll do quite a bit of work with summations near the end of Calc 2. Um, power series and, and other sorts of, of representations. But um, let's just look at some basic, basic examples. How about the sum from i equals 1 to 5 of 3i? So we're going to come back and evaluate this limit, but right now we've got to figure out how to do summations. All this is saying is that I start at 1, so this is 3 times 1, plus 3 times 2, times 3, plus 3 times 4, plus 3 times 5. And you might notice here that it's actually easier, since they all have threes with them, right? Let's pull the three out. done here is shown um, one of the properties of summations is that if you have a constant multiple, that constant multiple is in each term, so you can pull the constant multiple out first. So this is the same as 3 times the sum from i equals 1 to 5 of i. You see those expressions are the same? And so that's a property of summations. The sum from i equals 1 to n of c times a sub i is equal to c times the summation of a sub i. This is expressing this relationship just in more general terms. The a sub i's are just some terms that depend on i. It might be just i, it could be i squared, it could be all kinds of different things. But if you have a constant times those, you can pull the constant out in front. And if you see it, it, it should feel relatively clear, right? Yeah. So, can you see, just looking at the summation there, 
constant in this term. The eight is certainly a constant. Is there anything else? Turns out that n is also a constant, right? The thing that's changing here are the i's, right? So this is going to change. Every time I put in a different i, the i squared is going to change. But it's still going to be 8 over n cubed every time. So this 8 over n cubed is a constant. And I can pull that out of the summation. when you did this, if you wrote this out, if you started writing this out, every term would have an 8 over n cubed times something. 8 over n cubed times something, 8 over n cubed times something. So just like we did there, you could factor that 8 over n cubed out. Um, it also turns out that if you add up two terms, so you have a1 plus b1 plus a2 plus b2 plus a3 plus b3 all the way through, you can certainly like group all the a's together and then group all the b's together, which would look like the sum of the a's plus the sum the b's. So this is another property of summations. Not everything works this way, but certainly a lot of things do, right? Limits do, derivatives do. You can sort of apply it to both pieces of the sum or the difference separately. And we don't have that situation here, but that certainly comes up quite a bit when working with these kinds of of area definitions. Does that feel reasonable, what, what I'm doing there? Looks like A1 plus B1 plus A2 plus B2. It's just grouping all the A's together and then grouping all the B's together. what that second half is saying. What happens if we add up a constant term, so something that's not changing, like 7? We chose the constant. So it will be a value, but what do I, how many times am I adding up that constant? N times. N times, right? So it's 7 plus 7 plus 7 plus 7 plus 7. So this ends up being just the constant times N. magic or weird things to these proofs. It's just imagining them as sums and then using what we already know about sums to come up with, with the results. Um, those are all the kind of basic properties we need, but now we need to figure out some kind of specific sums with i's. So here's the first one, the sum i equals 1 to n of i, which is 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4, all the way up to n. Now there's a, there's a famous apocryphal story, I mean, it's not totally clear if it's true or not, but um, about a mathematician named Gauss, who's um, I'm a protege mathematician, a lot of famous mathematicians are very young. Um, by the time you get to my age or even your age, we're, we're sort of over the hill as mathematicians. Um, not that there's not a lot we can learn still, but um, to be a prodigy. Um, so in, in 
elementary school or something, this is way back, I think, 1700s or 1800s, um, frustrate his teacher because he knew all the answers. So the teacher said, well, add up the numbers from 1 to 100, um, which if you don't have a calculator, it takes you a long time. It's 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4, right, over and over and over. Um, but he came back immediately with the answer, um, and he did it by, well, the way a lot of things happen in math, which is not doing something directly, but instead looking at patterns. So if you imagine doing this, and this is the, the kind of special mind that it takes to be a, a spectacular mathematician, is to not see things in the sort of ordinary, direct way, but to look at things as relationships and patterns. What do you notice about those pairs? They're all the same, right? They're all 101, right? And how many pairs do you have? 50. So rather than adding them all up, let's just multiply 50 by 101, which turns out to be a, a quite easy answer. And it's, as many things too, it's sort of simple if you see it in, in the right way. Um, so what this is, is actually a general pattern. It's not just for 100. It's for any value of n. You take n times n plus 1 and divide it by 2. That's really what we did here, is like 100 divided by 2 was the 50 terms, and then 101 was the value of each of the terms. Turns out it also works for odd numbers as well as even numbers. Um, so this pattern holds. This is called um, this is a formula for the sum of the odds. So this is the this is the closed form, of the expanded notation, but it's equal to this formula. That's one I would like you to remember. There are lots and lots of these summation formulas, but that one. Um, so the one to, to file away. Okay. I'll give you uh, two more of those, and then I think that's all we'll need for summations. So you, could, you can impress friends at parties. Certain types of parties, certain types of friends. The sum of the i squared turns out to be um, n times 2n plus 1 um, times n minus 1 over 6. sum of i equals 1 to n of i cubed um, turns out to be n squared times n plus 1 squared over 4. I will not ask you to memorize those. Um, you will need them, but I will, I will give them to you on a test if you need them. Or, um, oh sorry, this is something odd. n plus 1. So I won't need you to memorize them. The only one I want you to memorize is this one. What about the uh, other three? The other three, you will use them. I don't think, you know, like a lot of things, you won't have to memorize them. It'll be part of your process. So you'll have to use them, but you won't have to, like, these are the only ones that you need to, like, repeat verbatim. <coughs> They're, they're harder to see, but they are related to that first, that first summation. Um, so these are facts. You know, sometimes when we're dealing with a new topic, if you haven't seen summation notation before or some other new topic, it can be sort of intimidating or hard to work with. 
we have, we're going to deal with summations in a very limited, small slice. They're all going to look very similar to each other. And so you can really get through this, even if you're feeling unsure about summations, you can get through this with fine colors by just following the rules. Um, a lot of times in calculus, we want you to do you know, a whole variety of problems, and it's not just enough to kind of memorize the rules. I'm telling you with this topic, it will be enough. Um, you will do fine by just following patterns with these. Okay, so we're, we're getting close. We took a little detour, but now we are able, hopefully, to evaluate this limit, which means finding this sum. And, of course, we have our formula here, right? The sum of the i squareds from 1 to n is always equal to that expression. n times 2n plus 1 times n plus 1 over 6. Just a straight substitution. As soon as I see the sum of the i squareds, that's my formula. And now, we should be back into a, a, a comfort zone. This is just really a polynomial on the top and a polynomial on the bottom. We're looking at the limit as n goes to infinity. We did this quite a ways ago, right back when we did limits, a limit at infinity. Um, I can multiply it out. Do a little simplification. And the two will cancel here, top and bottom. When I multiply this out, I get 2n cubed plus uh, 3n squared plus n. Just boiling out the top. What's this limit going to be? <clears throat> when we did these, when we did these back in the day, we said, well, the limit of the top and the bottom are both going to infinity. So we had a strategy. Now we know some more tools. What could you do to find this limit? If the top and bottom are both going to infinity, you could use L'Hopital's rule. Um, what you will see when you do L'Hopital's rule is that as you take these derivatives of these polynomial portions, um, they'll still go to infinity until you get rid of the n's, and these lesser values of n are going to go to zero. Like every time I take the derivative, they get smaller and smaller. They're going to go to zero. The way we did it in the past was we divided top and bottom by n cubed, which also made these lesser powers of n go to zero. So those are inconsequential for us. When you have a polynomial like this, or a fraction of polynomials, you just get the ratio of these leading coefficients. So this is going to be 8 thirds. These parts are all going to be n goes to infinity. So I don't need you to do that in any formal way. I mean, to be happy, you can just look at that and say that limit is going to be 8 thirds. So we, we did it. We actually found the limit calculus tools, a little bit of summation work, um, but we found what that is going towards. And it's really a kind of a big step. Um, there would be no way for us to actually find that area before this, right? I mean, you could have come up with estimates, and you could have done this summation thing and done it for a thousand rectangles or whatever, however your patients or computer programming skills would allow, right? But, but you still would have had an estimate, right? You wouldn't be quite sure where it's going towards. But we were able to, to tell that it's 
actually going to eight thirds, right? These rectangles, whether it's an overestimate or an underestimate or a midpoint, as you have more and more of those rectangles, those values, when you add them up, are getting closer and closer to eight thirds. So we actually calculated our first area using this definition. <coughs> you will always get the same power of n on the top and the bottom. It could be n squared over n squared, or n to the fourth over n to the fourth. It will always be the same power, in which case the lesser terms are always going to go away, and you can figure out what your limit is. If it's not the same power, then you made some little error in your process. It should always be the same. It should always be the same. Okay. Let's try another one of these, slightly more complicated, but the same idea. Let's find the area under um, f of x equals um, the 2 minus x squared on the interval minus 1 to, uh, let me make that 4 minus x squared on the interval minus 1 to 2. I don't know, probably about as complicated as you'll see for working through this process. Um, and I, I want to do it so that you you see kind of what's consistent between all of these problems and then what changes each time, right? Because some parts stay the same, but some of the parts change. So if we're trying to find area under the curve, the first thing we got to do is write down our definition. I will ask you for this definition on the test and the quiz. Just like the definition of the derivative, it involves a limit. Don't forget the limit. It's the limit of sums. It's fine with me if you just use f of x of i. You don't have to use f of x of i star. f of x of i star is just representing any value. f of x of i is representing the right endpoints, and those are the ones we use. But those are the components of this definition of area. Okay, what do we do now? Find delta x. Find delta x, and then x of i. Those are always the starting pieces that we need for using this definition. You need delta x first. Delta x is going to be yeah, 2 minus negative 1 over n, which is 3 over n. The width of your interval, which is 3, divided by n. And then our formula for x of i is I always have to start at a. So a, in this case, is negative 1. That's where I have to start. And then I'm going to add my delta x times i. I had it i delta x. But either way, right, I, I add the number of widths. Right? So for the fifth interval, i got to go five widths over. So you can memorize the formula, and that's fine. But you you could figure it out, too. So these are the two values I need. 
So, you know, in our last example, we didn't have anything there because we started our interval with zero. But here our interval is starting at minus one. So I have a number that is in there first. Okay, what now? Now I, I plug those into my definition. If you want, you can certainly save the limit till the end. You can even save the summation for a little bit because you've got to plug these in and do a little simplifying. f of minus 1 plus 3i over n. is 4 minus x squared. So be a little careful here. This is 4 minus negative 1 plus 3i over n squared. ideas, these big beautiful ideas, but then you have to deal with the, the details as well, the messy details. So this is going to be 4 times 3 over n, which is 12 over n. When I square this out, I'm going to get 1 minus 6i over n. Distributed this three here. You, you, I could have waited and done that afterwards. You guys see that? It's 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 algebra. It's just algebra, but it doesn't mean it's easy. Yeah. I'm still kind of lost where the, the four came from. This four here. So that's um, just my function. So whatever my function is, 4 minus x squared, whatever it is, I put in this x of i goes in there, but I need all those parts for the function. Twelve over n minus three over n plus eighteen i over n squared minus twenty-seven i squared over n cubed, 9 over n, plus 18i over n squared, minus 27i squared over n cubed. That is what I am summing, and then taking the limit. Questions on where any of those parts came from? You know, if, if you need to, there's nothing wrong with writing out this squaring. I mean, you probably don't even like the minus 1 first. Maybe you want to write this as 3i over n minus 1 times 3i over n minus 1. that out, you're going to get the same thing that I got in the parentheses. Distribute the negative 
So take your time there if you need to so that you get the algebra right. What I'm really creating in all of these problems, when you multiply everything out, what you will get is a polynomial in i. So here's a constant term, no i's. Here's an i term. You may or may not have all of these terms, right? And here's an i squared term. You may have an i cubed term, right? And you may be missing some of them or not. So when I use now my summation, I don't think you need to write it all out. Um, you just need to recognize here we're summing a constant. I can sum each of these separately, right? That was one of our rules of summations. So when I sum the constant, what do I get? The sum of 9 over n, n times? Yeah, it's 9 over n times n, right? That's the constant times n. 9 over n plus 9 over n plus 9 over n, n times. It would be 9 over n times 9. That's my constant rule for summations. And I will, I will warn you that this is, ends up being maybe the most common error. People forget to put this n here. So watch out for that. What about this piece? When I sum that? 18 over n squared, that's my constant piece. And when I sum up the i's, yeah, you can, you can do that. I already did this sum. <coughs> the sum of the i's. Famous mathematicians. N. Just learned it 10 minutes ago. But, but that's one you, you know, right? Or will know. And then this one you look up. That's our n times 2n plus 1. N plus 1 over 6. And I would, yeah. Could you do it the one on the top going down to the second one? The one down Here. Uh, so I took this 3 over N and distributed it to each of those. Oh, okay. So that, and I took the negative and distributed it to each of those. So I did that both together. That's where those three terms came from, and then those combined. Okay. And, you know, I think it's perfectly reasonable to go right from here to here as well. The same pattern is going to hold all the time. Whenever you sum these up, you're just summing up each of these polynomials in, in its own way. A constant gets multiplied by n. The i's turn into n times n plus 1 over 2. The i squares turn into that. That's the way summation works with those terms. And it, it may look a little messy, but it's, this is actually an easy problem at this point. The limit of the constant is just the constant. What's this limit here? Remember, I don't have to worry about the smaller powers of n, so I'm just looking at this leading power, which is 18 n squared over 2 n squared. So it just, yeah, it's 9, 18 over 2. So rather than multiplying it all out, which would give me 18 n squared plus 18n over 2n squared. The, this 18 over 18n is going to go to 0. So it just becomes the 18 over 2. Yeah. Um, so for the, how do you know what to put for the i and i squared? So those are those formulas um, 
I had them written up over here. Sum of the i's is n times n plus 1 over 2. That's that sum from 1 to 100. Right? That's the formula for it. And, and this one is the same. It's just the rule for the sum of the i squares. Okay. So I, I, you know, there's a reason for both of these. This one we saw a little bit why that worked. This one we didn't see any reason why this formula matches up. It's okay, right? We, we don't need that to know why that works um, for these. So just think of those as like direct substitutions. Whenever I see the sum of the i squareds, I'm just going to write this down. And I would give that to you, like on a quiz or a test. I would tell you the sum of the i squareds is this. Some of the I cubes is this. Okay, so what about this last term? It, it, it looks more complicated, but again, you can focus on just the leading term. So n times 2n times n times 27 is 54n cubed divided by 6n cubed. Like there's a bunch of other stuff there when I foiled it, but that other stuff's all going to go to zero. So that ends up being 9 as well. So this ends up being 9. These problems take a fair bit of paper right, and some kind of mental organization because you got to like realize where you are and what you're trying to do. But I would argue actually you've done much more challenging problems in the past. This is not an optimization or related rates level type problem. You have very specific formulas to use to get you started, move into the problem. There's a This is about as messy as they get, but there's a little bit of of algebra here in terms of multiplying everything out. But once it's all multiplied out, it's going to be very consistent in terms of how you do these. If it's a constant, you multiply it by n. If it's i's, it goes to this. If it's i squares, it goes to that. And then we take the limit as n goes to infinity. This process would become quite complicated if I moved away from a polynomial. So if I had a square root in here, or an e to the x, or a sine of x, all of a sudden we'd be, we'd be basically out of luck, because we wouldn't know how to evaluate what was left. Right? You could plug in all the work, you could find the delta x and the x of i, but if you have like a sine function in here, we don't know what that summation might be. So this process works for us, but it is only working for polynomials and very simple polynomials at that. So what we're going to need to do is develop a, a process that's going to work for other types of functions as well. Um, this is, we're um, creating this in a very similar way that we created the derivative. We started with our definition of the derivative, which was this limit. Um, we did some basic derivatives using the definition. And then we learn these shortcuts, right? A way of finding those derivatives without going back to the definition, because the definition was sort of too messy for us. And that's what we're working towards here in chapter five. This is our definition. This is what area is. We can use that definition in some basic situations. I want you to be able to do that. But as we move forward, we're going to need to learn something better. This method only works if the range is above zero? It, it turns out it's OK. Yes, so the range, um, good question. It is only going to give us area if the range or the y values are always positive. Um, if your function looks like this, you can still do this, 
But what's going to happen, well, you tell me, what's going to happen if I tried to do this definition of area with a function that was that looked like this? Yeah, because this value, all it's doing is it's adding up the height times the width. So this is all going to be fine, right? You're going to get effectively some area here. But as soon as you hit here, they're all going to be negative f of like the f of x is going to be negative times the width. So this is going to give you a negative area, which is not actually a thing, right? Like there isn't, you don't have negative area. But effectively, that's what it is. So if you added all these up, if these were the same size, you'd get zero. So your answer to this expression would be zero, which is clearly not the area in any sense of what's going on, but it, it is a value. Right? So the answer to your question is that you're only getting area if your function is always positive. But you can do it with positive or negative functions. And we are going to work with that and learn to interpret what that means. It no longer quite means area, but you can think about it like area. Right? So even though there is no such thing as negative area, it's perfectly workable to imagine that and to use that in your calculations. But in the beginning, you will just be working with positive functions, you don't have to worry about it, like they won't, they're not going to trick you with that at this point. So, um, but, but yeah, that leads to, to an important question, sort of as we, as we make this area definition more versatile, we'll have to worry about this situation. But it's, um, but for right now, our focus is on understanding this process and really understanding what this definition is, is telling us. So if you understand what the definition is telling you, it can help you interpret a lot of what's happening when you run into the sticky situations. So we will, big day today, I warned you about big days today. Um, so we, we will, we're not quite through 5.2, but we've done a lot. Um, of 5.2 as well as 5.1 and gotten into the, the hard part of 5.2. So there's still some kind of properties and results and definitions we need to do, um, but you can certainly start your 5.1 homework um, and we'll, we'll finish up 5.2 and probably do some group work on some ideas on Wednesday. Okay, I'll see you all then.
they get let off early then? Did they get let off early or did it just be no class in here? I think we got early. I didn't even realize we were to leave. Maybe I was just too focused on my phone. I don't know. Yeah, people did leave. Okay. <laughs> you said they're leaving like 11, 10, and stuff like, what the heck? People were leaving, I think they stayed on a little bit longer than they had. <coughs> but 